Um, similarly to last term, we're going to incorporate, or the end of last term, we're going to incorporate perspective now into each one of the assignments. So perspective is going to increasingly just be a tool that you're expected to apply in whatever way it is that uh, is going to be specific to the assignment in question. And we're going to be dealing with um, a deepening of the conversation regarding um, compositional stuff as we go forward. So as I kind of mentioned last class, what we were dealing with in terms of that image hierarchy right, and identifying a sense of importance in something and how that image hierarchy can take on a number of different, use the image hierarchy in a number of different ways. So by positioning things, right, we can create something that is more important than other things. We can create um, what we'll do next class, right? use contrast as a way of developing a sense of importance. You can use perspective as a way of accentuating a sense of importance. And you can also use a sense of overlap right? as a way of creating a sense of importance. So all of this, this is in the service of developing focal points and again, remember what we were dealing with last day is that <clears throat> your focal point is in an isolated space, right? which gives you a, a clear view of what its silhouette or of what its silhouette is, right? So that means it's not being overlapped. It's not overlapping anything. Right? It's in that breathing space or focal area or staging area, any one of those things will do in terms of I mean, describing the thing that we're talking about. And then the, sub or the subordinated elements of the IR hierarchy as they deal with overlap are, is something that is overlapping other objects versus something that is overlapped by objects versus something that is cropped by the frame. So all of this stuff is, specific or is particular or specific to your environment. <clears throat> now, the reason that this is important, right? and again, the, the gripping example that I was giving last day right, was that piece of paper sharing that type of silhouette value versus this piece of paper and that piece of paper having this or that silhouette value versus this piece of paper having this silhouette value and having the associated importance attached to that. Now, the reason that this is important, being able to distinguish between these things is first off and most importantly for us is that it allows us to identify what's most important inside the picture. That's an obvious thing. But identifying what is inside the picture doesn't mean or identifying where it is that you're supposed to be looking in the picture is all that this does it just tells you to look at this particular area regardless of what you call it you know that that area is important and then as a result of that whatever takes whatever occupies that space becomes important and right? so it's by virtue of how the picture is designed itself that makes that thing important that makes it a focal point it has nothing to do with what that thing is then, right and importantly how you design that thing, right? In terms of its silhouette, or in terms of its silhouette recognition, being able to physically identify what that's what the silhouette of that thing is, or what that object is, based entirely on its silhouette, right? Let you know what that thing is. So, designing the scene so this happens tells you where to look, but then designing this thing so that it's intelligible tells you what you're looking at. And both are obviously important for the correct interpretation of a picture. And so because we're isolating an object, nothing should be interfering with that object. And as a result, the interpretation of that silhouette should be easier. So as I mentioned last time, if I say can to you or to anybody, your brain basically comes up with what's called the icon. Oops. The icon of a hand. 
a fancy theoretical language for it is the signified. Right? This is the signified versus hand, which is the signified. It's telling you what that thing is. Basically, they mean, what that means is that this thing stands in for hand and your brain brings this image up so that when I say handy, your brain comes up with this so that it knows what it is that you're talking about. Now, the problem with this is that your brain is in the business of simplifying things. It's going to take the simplest imaginable possible version of what it is that it's trying to interpret and interpret in the easiest way, in the easiest way possible. Another problem with this, right, is that your brain has a fixed amount of images, right, a fixed amount of icons that it carries around in its kit bag that allows it to do this interpretive value, or interpretive value. And <clears throat> what that means is that if I say hand to your brain, right, but this is the version of a silhouette that you give to, or to, your, visual, or to your viewing audience, if you are, or if you, if your audience is only able to look at that picture for a very short period of time, this is what your audience sees, right? Which means that this becomes anything but iconic of hand, even though this is still a hand. Right? This isn't anywhere near as clear an icon of a hand as this thing is, and because your brain is in the business of simplifying things, if it sees things for a short period of time, it's not going to have the time. Right, to recognize the knuckles, the contour, the color, the veins, the tendons, right, the differences in value right, that help to identify a hand in this position, right, because this right, right, requires more time in order for you to identify what that thing is. This requires no time or very, very little time. Right, so what silhouette recognition is largely um, what's the word that I'm looking for? It's a bad, it's a bad vocabulary word. <clears throat> is largely in the influence of is what I think I've mentioned before called read speeds. And all this refers to is that <clears throat> we need a certain amount of time in order to identify objects of varying, varying degrees of complexity. As I mentioned, when we were talking about the figure ground relationship, we're very, very good at separating one thing from another in terms of one thing being in front of another, as long as that thing is both relatively clear. And we can do this in a fraction of a second. But an easier way of thinking about what I mean by read speeds is think about what your attention span is when you're surfing, when you're scrolling through Instagram on your phone, right? Or if anybody does this channel surfs, right? Anyone or flips through a magazine. Right, just looking at pictures, right? or is driving by a billboard. The amount of time that you have in order to interpret the information that is presented to you, it's again, it's fraction of a second, right? Whereas, and now compare that to say, what your experience of say, going to an art gallery is, or sitting down and reading a math, a math textbook, right? and the illustrations that are associated with it. You need a lot more time right, in order to do that. So basically what I'm saying is that this right here would be a really long read speed. This right here is a really short read speed. And what we want for our focal points is for them to make visual impact. We want those things to not only be identifiable in terms of where, but what we're physically looking at. So that when an audience is looking at a picture and that focal point makes its visual impact, we not only know that it's important, but we all we also know what's important. And so as a kind of banal example of this, every year we drive back to Edmonton to visit the whole clan because that's where everybody still lives. And on the way, I've got a friend who lives in Canada and I stop and visit him. And there's this one particular trip where I drove by this billboard that made me so angry that I had to stop, right? And turn around and go back and look at it to see what the hell it was trying to communicate. And it ends up being right, that it's an ad for divorce lawyers. But the ad is a giant screaming baby head with a whole bunch of unintelligible type and with a hideous color scheme attached to it. So as far as I could tell by driving past this thing, this thing was, or this thing was selling giant screaming, nauseatingly colored baby heads, right? which is obviously not what it was trying to communicate. But 
what that means is that that particular medium was terribly designed for the amount of time that they had to try to communicate their message. What works really well on a, on a billboard is buy here, here. Big letters, high contrast, easy to read, maybe a picture of a beer can. That's what goes on that type of messaging system. Now, if you've got a different type of messaging system, we can now take time right, to look at this stuff. Right now, the importance of this for a silhouette is that when your brain sees something for a short period of time, it's very good at capturing shapes. You're very good at recognizing general stuff, right? And general stuff's being really basic shapes, right? That take a short period of time to recognize. We're not very good at doing stuff like this, where it's like, all right, well, now I've got to draw a hand. All right, well, what do the individual knuckles look like? What do the separation of the fingers look like? What do the tendons look like? What's the stupid tattoo look like? Right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of this stuff that's inside the edge or the silhouette line, that takes a long time for us to recognize, or at least long. So details come second. What we're going to recognize first is the silhouette value of a particular thing and then interpret the shape, interpret the object based on the identifiability of that silhouette. Right? And there's going to be limitations to this. Right? And what those limitations essentially require is for you to identify what's essential about that object and then show that essentiality right, to your audience. So as a, a really basic example, if I was to ask you what's essential about a square, what would you say that is? Uh, four equal length slides. Four equal sides. Okay, great. Now, what else is essential about a square? 90 degree angles. 90 degree angles. Okay. So if I was to do this, cover that much of that object, do I still know for certain that that's a square? No. Yeah. No. Now, if I exposed a little bit more, do I know that? Do I know that it's now for certain a square? No. 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 Why? What else could it be? A rectangle. Mm -hmm. Be a rectangle. Now, what happens if I do this? Do you know for certain that it's a square? And let's say, not say for no. certain, to a no. high degree of probability, do you know that it's a square? Okay. Yeah. 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 Because what your brain does is it fills in that gap. Okay? Because there's enough information there to understand that that thing is a square. We've got three equal corners. These, square, these lines look like they're going in the same direction. They're probably going to intersect at that point. I mean, there is the possibility, you know, that if we covered up that corner that, yeah, this could do something like fucking that, right? But probably not. It's probably going to be a square. Okay, so that's an easy, that's an easy example, right? In terms of like, you'd have to show at least that much of that object in order to know that it's a square. Now, what happens though, if I do something slightly more complex? What's that as an object? And the problem here is if you can't tell what that object is just by virtue of its silhouette, it's, it's failing in its job of being able to be interpreted in a really short amount of time. And it's failing in its job in terms of making the impact that a focal point is gonna have. So do you know what this thing is? Is it a capsule? It could be a capsule. What else could it be? <clears throat> Army dog tag. Okay. Let's take it back to the box. Look at the square. If that was the silhouette of an object, what's this thing? You don't know. Yeah. Basically, anything that's anything that's box-like, anything that's relatively square. So same thing here. Anything that can take on this shape right, is now potentially 
that object. Now let's say that I made the object, I made it a little bit easier. And I do this. I gave you some interior detail to deal with. Do you now know what that object is? What could it be? Okay, the, well, the keychain, like like the place where you put the key, the keyhole. The key. Okay, could be that. Could be a light switch. Yeah. Along those lines. Basically, if you're not sure, that's a good sign that your silhouette is doing, isn't doing its job, right? You've got a poorly designed silhouette. Now, what happens if I take that silhouette, change it? Now, what is it? Ear mug? It looks like a bag on the side. So it's maybe, a, maybe if I draw it. A cup? A cup. Right, so if we're looking at that thing right from this side and getting that view, even the in introduction of interior detail isn't enough in order to make it clear. By turning it though, so that it's 90 degree, this becomes essential, right? For the design of that object, to be able to identify what that object is. This is essentially your job, ah, pun intended, um, for designing your focal point, is trying to figure out what that object, what's essential about that object as you design its silhouette, so that when somebody looks at it, they don't have a problem with recognizing it. And they won't have any problem with other objects interfering in the interpretation of that silhouette because of how that object is isolated right, inside that environment, inside that area. And so with certain objects, the position of the object itself is going to limit right, its interpretability. Like you're going to have to find the best position for the beer mug cup, et cetera, so that because you know what's essential about that object, you know that you have to identify it. Right, that thing in terms of its silhouette design, right? Because this position isn't going to do it, even though it's the same object. Now, what about this thing? Let's say, let's say that this thing is a television set. How would you take that and turn it into a television, but only able to use its silhouette design? What could you do to it to change it? Some antenna on the top. Okay, so I put antenna on top of it. Now, what's weird about doing that? I agree that that now becomes a television, but what's weird about that decision? We don't have those kind of TVs anymore. We don't have those kind of TVs anymore. But in a way, that doesn't matter because what you're setting out to do is iconically identify television. Right? And when you look at this, you immediately know that that's what it's supposed to be, or I don't know, maybe giant evil robot head or something like that, right? but most probably a television. Now, let's say that you wanted to update that and leapfrog into the 21st century and you wanted to turn that shape into a television. What else could you do to change its silhouette? Add a stand on the bottom. Just do this. That now becomes a television or at the very least a monitor that can substitute as a television. Now, let's say that you wanted to distinguish this from television but turn it into a computer monitor. What could you add to the silhouette? A webcam. Like a little circle at the top. Okay, you could do that. Yeah. What else could you add? A keyboard. Keyboard. Great. Mouse. Etc. The point being is that there's a little bit of thought that needs to go into trying to identify exactly what it is that you're drawing when you're faced with this severe of a restriction in terms of it, or in terms of its design. Because, because we're naturally detail-oriented creatures, like when we focus on things, and we'll get into this when we deal with value and color and stuff, right, in the next number of classes, we're very, very good at doing this. And because we need to, say, physically focus on things, like when I want to pick this thing up, I can't just be looking over here and expect to grab it relatively consistently. Like, i got to look at the goddamn thing, right, pick it up, right, and, you know, bring it to my attention. And as a result, as I'm doing that, I recognize all the details, et cetera. So we're very, very good at doing this and we're very naturally inclined to want to focus on those details or to think about things in details. But this is ironically and irritatingly 
contrary to the way that our brains recognize things, right, and interpret things. Okay, so we're trying to take advantage of what the brain does naturally in terms of identifying a silhouette, right, and identifying its importance. Okay, so before I flip over, right, and continue the conversation, this isn't a bad screen or a bad page to screenshot, although there's a little bit crazy maybe. Now, the reason that this is important, not only because it distinguishes between focal points and environment, but also because there are problems that you're going to run into when you design a silhouette. Most of those problems are going to occur with your environment. So again, in terms of that image hierarchy, your, your focal point is isolated. And then your environment has those other those other three levels of importance, overlapping, overlapped, and cropped. And, and I'm just gonna keep hitting this again and again, because even though this is a relatively straightforward point, and I think you guys get it, because this isn't an intuitive way of thinking about image making, this tends to get just kind of like forgotten. Right? Um, and that should become obvious right, right in a moment. Terms of what I mean by that. Okay, so this is again all focal point stuff. This is all environment stuff. Because your focal point is isolated, the only problem, and let's just call this sort of problems of silhouette design. The only problem that you should occur or that should occur for you with the design of your focal point is intelligibility. Your only job, right, is to make sure that that focal point that you're designing for your assignment, right, is intelligible when I look at it. Right, so this doesn't sound like it's a big deal. Right, but ends up being more of a problem than you tend to think because of, again, us being detail oriented. Give me an object, any object that's relatively complex. Like don't give me a cup or a circle or something like that. TV remote. TV, okay, well, let's move away from geometric objects. Let's pick something, let's pick something animate. Dog. A dog, okay. So let's say you really like dogs. Right? Never in your life have you been more attracted to something, more excited about drawing something than the dog that you've conceived of, right? And that you really want to share with your viewing audience. You are incredibly excited about drawing the most, the cutest, the best dog ever. This is your prime goal. So let's say that you've got your dog, right? And your dog is lying down, right? And your dog has cute little dog face, cute little dog wrinkles, it's a, it's a fat, like one of those things with like the folds of skins and shit, right? And it's got its little cute little dogs tucked up underneath its cute little dog face. It's got its cute little dog ears, right? Flopped over top of its cute little dog head. And it's got its cute little dog feet back here, all tucked up, right? Fat dog folds of flesh right back over there as well. It's got its cute little dog tail coming out here doing cute little dog things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so let's say that that's your dog, right? But you, right, unfortunately, forgot to remember that your audience is only gonna see this for a split second. When your audience only sees something for a split second, this is what your audience sees. All it sees is the outline. of that particular thing, it sees the general shape of that thing. So what that means is that this is what your audience sees. It only sees that shape. So if your goal was to communicate the ultimate in dog cuteness, that's the exact opposite, right? Of what it was you're trying to communicate. Now, if you were trying to communicate dog, right, and the whole goal was just to, all right, I just want 
I just want dog. Well, there's a variety of ways of communicating dog. That's one way. That's dog. Right? And your audience gets it immediately. Right? This is your goal with your assignment, right? For your focal point. I want your focal point to be immediately identifiable, right? In terms of its silhouette. Right? And the problems that you're going to face, one, are intelligibility. Right? But in terms of that intelligibility, you're going to have to identify what's essential about the design of that object. This is why I wanted you to watch the Sin City example, right? Because as the dog is eating Elijah Wood's legs, right? It becomes immediately obvious that that thing is a dog, right? Or that is a wolf, right? Because of the texture of its fur, right? You can even tell that it has a certain kind of fur to it. You can tell that it's, a certain, it's in a certain kind of position, but it's immediately understandable what that thing is. Other limitations that you're going to experience are position, right? Which is closely related to perspective, right? So for instance, right? showing the cup from a bird's eye view, that's not a cup, right? To your brain, right? This again could be very easily be a keyhole right? for, or in terms of its interpretability, interpretability. Right, so the perspective you choose is radically going to influence the position of the object with, with respect to the viewer, and as a result, radically change how that object is interpreted via its silhouette. So for those of you who are, fam are familiar with, say, Bugs Bunny, right, or Daffy Duck, right, or any of those Looney Tunes, or Mickey Mouse, for God's sakes, like this is what Mickey Mouse looks like in terms of his basic character design. something along those lines, right? But have you ever wondered why you never see Mickey Mouse from any position other than this? You never see him from a bird's eye view. You never see him from a, down, or from a worm's eye view. You never see him in an exaggerated perspective because what happens to his ears right, in that position? Like, do they just like, do they rotate up like helicopter pads, right? Or, blades, it's a straight right? So line. or is it just a straight two-dimensional surface? Like the character doesn't work from that perspective. And as a result, you never see the character from that perspective. Or in relationship to say Bugs Bunny, Bugs Bunny doesn't look good from that perspective. So you never see the character from that perspective. And so as a result, there's gonna be built-in limitations to how you come across this. Generally speaking, the more simple your perspective is, right? So generally speaking, say this, the horizon line in frame, because this is the way that we view the world most of the time, it's going to be easier to design a silhouette right, for an audience. Now, that being said, if I drew a character like this, with the horizon line in frame, that's a really good silhouette for a human being. Right? We sent this shit into space for a reason. Now, if I was to look straight down on that view, though, this is what that thing looks like, right? That's a terrible version, right? So this with the horizon line in frame, this is maybe from a bird's eye view, same pose. Now, if that character is lying on the ground, right, in the same pose, now that's a great, that's a great position for that character in a bird's eye view, or great silhouette for that character in a bird's eye view. But if you're trying to show that same character with the camera lying on the ground, that's what that thing looks like. Okay, so it's contextual. You're gonna to have to figure out the best possible position perspective, what's essential about that object in order to make that thing intelligible. Because what I'm gonna ask you to do for your focal point is to not only right, draw around right, and give me a clear silhouette of that, but I want you to fill that entire silhouette with black, right? So that there's not an opportunity in order to develop any detail inside of it. Okay, so your focal point is going to be a solid fill of black. Right? And we'll go over the specifics of how you do this with your assignment when it comes time to do it.
Okay, so I belabored that point a little bit more than general, but I wanted to make it absolutely clear because again, this stuff does tend to disappear into the background because it's not an intuitive way of thinking. Generally, when you start drawing stuff, you just start drawing stuff you want to draw. I want to draw dogs. Great, I'm going to draw dogs. Right? And it's like my suggestion is that you can't do that. Right? You got to figure out, well, what is this dog trying to communicate? Can Is it communicable to your audience? Right? And this is what does that job. Okay, so that's not a bad right, screen or page to screenshot. Because everything else that we're going to do right, relates to all of this stuff here. The problems that you're going to encounter when you deal with objects in your environment. Now, for your environment, you're going to have to have, again, all of your objects overlapping, overlapped, or cropped by the frame. So that in terms of the image hierarchy, they're not... Um, they're not taking it attention away from the focal point. But there are other different, there are different ways of taking attention away from the focal point, right? And these are gonna be the problems that you encounter with your environment. Right? And again, this is because of your brain trying to make things simpler. And as a result of trying to make things simpler, ironically makes things more complex for us in certain situations. So one problem that, so these are all problems with your environment. If you put your focal point inside that isolated space, breathing space, et cetera, these problems shouldn't come up with your focal point because there's going to be nothing for it to interact with. It's just going to be empty space. So the other problems that you'll have with two, three, and four of overlapping, overlap, and cropped are there's three different categories of it. One, let's call it, let's call it new objects. In your brain's business of simplifying things, it's also in the business of searching for the simplest pattern, which means that it will combine things, right? Combine multiple objects into a single pattern if it makes it easier for it to understand, right? So for those of you who are familiar with science, sorry, this is kind of like the law of parsimony. If you've got an easier explanation, right, for the exact same thing, the easy explanation wins over the more difficult explanation. Okay, so let's say that Let's go back to our friend, the square. As an all too short historical interlude for 20th century modern art, there's a group of people in mid 20th century called um, hard edge abstractionists. Hard edge abstractionists were in the business of telling people that objects were objects, paint was paint, canvas was canvas, and those paintings and that canvas and that material didn't refer to anything other than itself. So a square that was blue was just a blue square on canvas. It wasn't a representational window onto another world as the history of art had led up to until that point, right? It was just a blue square on a canvas. Right? That's it, nothing else. So let's say that you're one of these people, right? And you're painting squares. You can look this up, people did this shit, right? And this is, you know, your ideal version of the message that you're trying to send. Great. Now let's say that you get a little race here as you go on and you want to identify, you want to share triangles with your audience, right? So your whole point of these pictures right, is that your audience comes away with the idea of the squareness of squares and the triangularity of triangles. Right? That's all that you're trying to communicate, right? You don't want this to be an illusionistic representation of reality, so to speak. You're fed up with it. There's too much history surrounding it already. You hate it for all intents and purposes. Now let's say towards the end of your career, you really get a little saucy, right? And you start combining these things. So now you've got this as your PS de la resistance of your artistic career. What's the problem with combining the triangle and the square that way? People are gonna think People. it's a house. People are gonna think it's a house. Right, because what your brain does is that if it can simplify that pattern into a single thing, it will. Right? That's what your brain sees when it sees those two things inter or interacting like that. Right? So rather than being triangle and square and not representing anything, now you've got house representing something with all the historical, right, sociological baggage that house comes along with. 
but alternatively, but also, and importantly, is that you may have just now created a brand new object that's equally isolated in space that now serves as a competing focal point for your primary focal point, which becomes obviously and problematic at a different level of interpretation for the picture. Let's take a, a less banal example. Let's say you've got stained glass window, right, and Bob, right, who's off on vacation, taking a picture of himself to prove that he was there, right, before Notre Dame burnt to the ground, right. What's the problem with Bob taking this picture in front of that stained glass window like that? Well, uh, he is on top of the glass, so he's not actually. Fair enough, right? So we're not identifying as important, but, but, but what might this also be interpreted as? guys. What's that? One of those like London guards. Whatever the royal. Yeah, it looks like a person wearing a big silly hat. Right? Well, if this person's in a cathedral in a church, who else wears big silly hats in a cathedral or a church? Popes, priests, priests, bishops, cardinals, right, etc. So, what this communicates indirectly, right, is you know, and this is obviously a stretch, right, but hopefully it's making the point, right, is that. It's communicating something potentially that's other than what you want to communicate. If this is a story about Bob on vacation, well, this is starting to communicate something that's much more complex than Bob on vacation, potentially. This might be Bob with delusions of grandeur, right? About maybe fantasizing about being the next Pope. This might be Bob envisioning himself as the risen Christ. This might be Bob, right? With having suffering, some sort of suffering, some sort of mental breakdown, right? And us being privy to the interior or his interior model. The point is it's not triangle and square anymore. It's not, it's house. It's not Bob on vacation, you know, it's Pope. But if I want to communicate square and triangle, I just have to overlap those things in a different way. So that now those things are separate from each other. They maintain their independence because I've still shown what's essential about that object and about this object and do the exact same thing with Bob. Say that Bob is just a character in your background. You don't want him to have too much focus, but you do want it populated with tourists. That's a nice way of disrupting his back or his silhouette right? and still identifying the context of where, they're, or where people are at inside their environment. Okay, so by the creation of new objects, you can start to tell new narratives, new stories essentially start to be developed in the mind of your audience, which are potentially distracting. And equally as important as trying to avoid this in this assignment is to be aware that this can be used of a purpose as well. Let's say that you wanna tell a story about a person with delusions of grandeur, being the risen Christ, you know, fantasizing about being the next Pope. Right? This is a great way to show that without actually saying, oh, Bob thinks he's the Pope. Isn't that funny? Right? It's like, no, you can just show him positioned like this repetitively throughout the story right? as a way of identifying right, that something else is happening right, in the subtext of the story. So the Austin Powers example that I want you to watch, right? that's obviously stupid and funny and silly, right? but it's stupid and funny and silly, right? utilizing exactly this to create those jokes, right? the slapstick humor. Right, by taking two objects combined in a way that conveys an entirely different message than would otherwise be interpreted if you saw it with all the detail. Okay, so again, this is something that can commonly occur because again, it's not an intuitive thing to pay attention to how you're overlapping objects right, in your background, but this happens all the time. <clears throat> this is also something that you shouldn't really stress too much about if you're doing thumbnail versions of your drawings first, this is something that you look at when you're starting to fine tune your drawing, because this is something that you only really start to recognize when you're doing that fine tune. You can't really kind of conceive of all of the problems that crop up when you're doing a drawing right at the beginning. And this is why drawings take multiple iterations generally in order to fine tune. <clears throat> 
Okay, so any, any questions about what I mean by this? So I'll be looking for versions of this in your background, right? essentially, is what I'm saying. So you have to overlap your background, right? but you can't overlap them in a way that does this. Second problem that you might come in, in touch with is the creation of visual tension. Now the problem with tension is that it develops focus. This is essentially what how perspective creates focus. So when you got your one point vanishing point and all of your lines recede to and converge at this point, all of this, all of that convergence, the intersection of all of those points, create tension and as a result create focus. The problem with this is that if we do that in a picture say with the triangle and the square again, if we bring those two objects just to the point where they touch or barely touch, that creates focus. Right? And it will do the exact same thing with the frame. So if we did that with the triangle and it just barely touched the frame, that creates focus. Now, the problem with that is that if we don't want those things to be focused, we want something else to be focused, this now undermines the effectiveness of the focal point itself. And again, this stuff happens all the time. Right? And sometimes right, these two things right, interact with each other. So a really common version of this is to have, say, Bob standing underneath a window, right? but that window now looking like it's balanced on top of his head. So now he doesn't even look like he's wearing a hat. He looks like he's you know, balancing a hat on top of his head. Right? And it's creating a focal point at the intersection between those two things. And so this is problematic in a totally different way. And so do you guys still do that assignment in the first term where you gotta like take a bunch of squares and arrange them in different ways and make them feel different? Yeah, yeah? we do. Yeah. yeah, first time I watched it, first time I saw a class doing that assignment, I was like, oh, you poor bastards. That's a terrible assignment. But it is a really good assignment, right? Because if you can take those squares, Right. And by terrible assignment, I just mean it's like it's, there's only so jazzed up you can get about squares. Um, but it's a really good assignment. And the whole point of that assignment is that if you can take something that you don't care about, like an abstract geometric shape, and make a picture that's created no by nothing but those shapes, right, then and make it feel a particular way, you, you're on to something. Though, right? Because now if you can take things like subject matter that people actually care about, like Bob and stained glass windows, and arrange them in similar ways, the concept is exactly the same. So say if you wanted to create a picture that felt really tense, this would be a really good way of doing it, where you just took a whole bunch of squares, arranged them in proximity to each other so that they weren't really overlapping, but they're all just kind of vibrating up against each other at different shapes and sizes. That starts to create a very active and kinetic type of space, right? Because it's full of this kind of visual tension. So I don't know. Did I ask you? Did I include as the video clips? Did I include um, legend? I don't think I did. Old Ridley Scott movie. Tom Cruise, the devil. Tom Cruise saves the saves the universe from plunging into eternal darkness. Blah blah blah. As the devil is wont to do. Well, at the beginning of that movie, and I'll show you the clip afterwards. I highly recommend watching this movie, if for no other reason than uh, Tim Curry, the guy who plays the devil, his prosthetics in, in terms of his devil costume still hold up, even in the age of uh, CG. You have uh, the devil up here with his big pointy devil finger telling his little goblin henchman, I think his name is Blitz or Blitzkrieg or something like that, and his little goblin nose down here. And the devil is telling the goblin to go off and steal a unicorn and steal a princess and thereby plunge the world into the universe into everlasting darkness, you know, standard stuff. And as he's telling him this, he's also telling them all the horrible things that are going to happen to a poor little blitz should he fail in his mission. And as he does that, the finger gets closer and closer and closer to poor little blitz's nose, right? And as a result, the tension starts to go up and up and up in the frame, right? So just like you can use this, the creation of new objects in order to create 
a different kind of picture if you're doing it on purpose. You can use stuff like this as a way of creating tension as well. But for purposes of your assignment, don't do this and don't do this or try to avoid it as much as possible. So objects just coming and touching with each other. Really good for creating tension, but also really terrible for undermining right, primary focal points. Okay, so as a nice, easy way of avoiding that, when you're overlapping objects in your environment, just make sure that they're entirely overlapped as opposed to just barely overlapped. Okay, before I switch the page, um, this is a good screenshotter, um, but also any questions about what I mean by those two things? All right, last one then. Last problem is transition. Right? And this is specifically, it's called visual transition. You've already kind of been exposed to this when we did the uh, horizon line variation assignment. And increasingly, this will also be the case. Like things that I've referring to in individual classes now, we've already kind of done. And I'm just gonna kind of be pointing in between the lines as to why we were doing them beforehand and how they work specifically. Right, so visual transition is when one object stops and another one begins, but there's no visual cue that that's happened. So not being able to identify where the horizon line stops and where the object begins basically means not only do you lose perspective depth of that object, you also just kind of visually move past it. What we need in order to create or to get away from visual transition is something like this. You need a visual step so that one object is separable from another object. So for instance, the Iron Giant example that I want you to watch. What you have when the little boy is looking at the um, electric or the electric station, whatever you call those things, Right, you essentially just have a tree line, varying trees, right, et cetera. But then it turns out that one of those trees, right, is the iron giant's head, right? And it's not until his eyes turn around that you recognize that that thing was in the background. Right, so just like this, right, is something that you're going to avoid for your assignment, right, in favor of this. When you overlap objects, it can also be used in a, as a way of hiding things in plain sight, so to speak. So this is a really common thing. So a really easy example of this and where it gets visually confusing. Let's say that this is a building, as a, but you arrange a lamppost next to your building like that, or sorry, a street sign next to your building like that, and then the street sign coming out of it, out of the post like that. Well, what it looks like is that that street sign is growing out of the building. Right, or that ledge is growing out of the building, as opposed to say, doing something more like this, where you have those silhouettes not overlapping, right, but now inside of each other, so that we're not confused. Or doing, not doing something like this, where I have the edge of that street sign and it's post directly backed up against the edge, right, because again now, it looks like this. It just looks like a differently shaped silhouette. Okay, so I think there's an example in your handout that's a little less simplistic than this, where it's like you have a cabin in the woods type of scenario, where if you wanted to highlight that cabin in the woods, uh, you drop the tree line down behind that cabin so that the silhouette of the cabin becomes a bit more apparent. But if you wanted to say, identify a different kind of cabin. Or rather a different kind of person in the cabin. You might have that silhouette of the cabin just seamlessly blend right, with the tree line. And if we put texture on top of that, say like those shingles and stuff like that, that might be even more seamlessly integrated into the environment 
this might be a person that lives in the cabin that really wants visitors, right? Is trying to pronounce themselves to the environment. This might be the hermit in the woods that wants to remain invisible and doesn't want visitors. Okay, so again, you can do it for a variety of reasons, just like everything that I say in this class, irritating me. Okay, but for purposes of your assignment, try not to do this. Try to do that like with how you overlap objects in your environment. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, well, um, this is a screenshot then. Similar to your last assignment. Actually, yeah. can you explain a little bit more what the difference between transition and overlapping is? Um, well, they're not really differences. They're more of like a different way, different ways of overlapping so that you're not, you're not combining images. It's a different way of combining images. So for instance, like when the side of the building comes down into the side of the street, the street sign, if the street sign or the post is perfectly aligned with the side of the building, what your brain does is this. It combines those two things with each other. So they don't become, they don't become distinct objects anymore. That, that make it more clear? Yeah. 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 So here in a way, like over here, like, and this is where it can be confusing. It's like the silhouette of that building might still be this, right? Which is potentially just as confusing, right? But because we've overlapped that street sign in a particular way, the building also creates a frame for that object. And as a result, makes a distinctly separate object from itself but also is depreciated and in, in, in turn depreciates this object because they're now overlapping each other in a different way or in different ways. So hopefully you can kind of get a sense as to why this is kind of like a, a fine tuning type of thing. Like this isn't something that you do at the thumbnail stage. This is something that you do and you're looking at your picture and it's like, eh, fucking something's kind of weird, right, about it. And, and you start looking for these little things that you can change to just kind of tighten the screws a little bit. Okay, so similarly to your last assignment, this is gonna be, an, or last couple of assignments, I guess, this is gonna be an assignment in three parts, combined the same way, same presentation, the whole, the whole deal. All right, drawing number one, this time, we're gonna mix and match perspectives. So drawing number one, you're gonna create a natural environment. Right, but that natural environment is, it's gonna be, it's gonna have a lot of variety. So as much variety as possible. It's gonna be in two point, right, to accentuate that. But I want your breathing space, right, so your focal area to be in the center. So contrary to what your last assignment was. Because there's a wide variety of reasons why you might wanna do this. Have a natural environment, right, that's ace or that's um, obliquely oriented, but because you want to pronounce a focal point to a higher degree, you position it inside the center of the frame. What I'd also like you to do, right, is to have your one point vanishing point, right, in the center of the frame, right, in that breathing space as well. So now we've got this and this both creating focus, right, but with a totally different kind of mood attached to it. So we're amping up the focal value of that picture, right? But we're naturalizing the mood of that picture. Second part of your assignment, you are gonna design three silhouettes. What those silhouettes are, I don't care, totally up to you. Each has to be intelligible. Now, what I mean by intelligible is that I need to be able to identify solely based on its silhouette, what, that is, what those objects are. Okay, so, in the, so in the service of doing that, you're gonna fill 
each silhouette a different color. One of them, you're gonna fill white. One, you're gonna fill 50% gray. And three, you're gonna fill black. So this will be a nice transition into us dealing with value next class as well. Right? Now you can do this however you want. You can do it old school style and color this in pencil wise. It's totally fine. Whether or not it's a perfect 50% shade of gray, I don't care as long as it's gray. Right? But make this as dark as possible. Keep this white, which means that I don't want to see any interior lines. Right? And even if there are interior lines, I'm not going to pay attention to them in terms of detail. Because right? all I want to be able to see is can I can I can I make sense of that silhouette just based on its exterior line? Can I make sense of that object just based on its, its silhouette? Now keep in mind that I probably have an entirely different visual vocabulary than you do, right? In terms of my knowledge of popular culture, etc. Right. So as a simple example, I know that Pokemon exists as a thing, as a phenomenon. Right. I have no idea what those things look like. Right? I know that one's yellow, and I think that there's a dinosaur or a dragon as well, right? But that's it. That's all I got, and I don't know what shape those things are. So now would be a bad time to, say, introduce a Pokemon silhouette and expect me to be able to identify what that thing is. Same thing with mech warriors or anything. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't design for a stylized universe and have your audience identify what your silhouette is. Right, so for instance, if I did this, what is that? Lollipop. Ping pong paddle. Yeah. Ping pong paddle. Cool. Right, now, push. All right, now what if I did this? Now what's that? A tree. Yeah. Okay. So this could be my super stylized tree, for instance. Like let's say you're designing for a South Park or something like that. This isn't going to fit in a South Park world. This would fit in a South Park world, right? But in order for me to be familiar with what the silhouette of trees in South Park world look like, your audience needs some time, right? To be exposed to those things for a while first. Right? They're not going to get it straight out of the gate. Like if you just showed this to somebody, you know, in a blank field, right, with nothing around it, just in a field of white, you're not going to know what that thing is. But if you show people walking in a park, right, in that universe, these things in the background, oh, that's what a tree looks like in this environment. Okay, so please edge on the side of caution in terms of me being able to identify what these silhouettes are going to be. Try to make it as universal as possible for the amount that that term makes sense at all. Can you give an example for like the second one? What do you mean? Uh, Cause you, there was it one you fill white, three you fill black, two is the 50% gray. Yeah, I'm gonna show you an example of a, a previous student example in a, or in a second. Okay, now, part number three is that you are now gonna overlap one and two. Two is going to be in front of one, right? So that this is more important than that thing. But also as we'll see from next class, as we move into dealing with value and its creation of depth, this because it's slightly darker than one, will feel like it's closer to the front of the picture as well. Okay, so we're overlapping not only in terms of depreciating importance, we're also overlapping in terms of creating depth as well. Okay, and then number three, that goes into your focal area. Breathing space over top of your one point vanishing point, et cetera. Okay, what this will also do is introduce, because this is gonna be colored black, this will also introduce high contrast, 
which as we'll go over next class is the easiest possible way of creating focus. So now we have yet another way of developing focus inside that picture. Okay, so again, it's one drawing in three parts as opposed to three separate drawings. Okay, with the rest of your environment, also it should go without saying, everything is overlapped, right? Or overlapping, right? In a similar way that I was talking about last day. Okay, so if you've got your focal area here and you wanna put a sun in the sky up over here, overlap that shit with a cloud, right? So that that becomes less important, right? But then again, paying attention to how you're overlapping objects. Now, before we look at some examples here, um, I'll show you the assignment. <laughs> okay, so again, this is right, the exact same description that I've just written down right, in terms of what it is that you're, that you're doing. Right? All of these things have to be intelligible, right? And then again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, with the different levels of fill. Right? And then the presentation of this is exactly the same. This is due next Friday. So not this Friday. Due Friday, I think that's July 9th. Right? So you got weird overlap of classes because I wasn't able to teach this Friday coming up. Um, your assignment that I had given you last term is still due this Friday morning coming up, but this assignment isn't due until next Friday, which will be your next class. So you've got a good chunk of time to do this, but please be uh, please manage your time appropriately. Okay, so here's a really good example, right, of that assignment. There's your natural environment. Everything kind of overlaps, right, or overlapping. Here's your central breathing space, right, conspicuously empty and waiting for a focal point. There are your three different silhouettes all identifiable, right? So even though there's interior detail here in terms of this dividing line, even if I erase that, that thing's still identifiable right, in terms of what that object is. So if you filled it entirely with white, that would be fine. So you can do this hand-drawn. You can also do this in Photoshop. Like you can just drag this into Photoshop, fill the whole thing in with white, 50% gray, 50% black. It's totally fine by me. And then copy and paste it back into this. Again, that's fine. So here, those things are not overlapping, only overlapping each other, right? But they're also overlapping the environment. And then here, you can see how this thing, right, doesn't have anything overlapping it at all, right? Right in the middle, right? The vanishing point's pretty close to it, right? And it's got this really high contrast stuff. So Does that make more sense now? Uh, just to clarify, the black one is on its own and the other two are overlapping? Yeah, exactly, right? So 50% gray one is overlapping the white fill one. Right? And the black fill one is going to be the one that's acting as your focal point. Any other questions about the assignment? <laughs> Okay, well, let's take a look at, let's take a look at the example that I didn't show you, first off. Oh, so good. I also recommend uh, watching this movie um, because uh, Tom Cruise essentially saves the universe with his secret weapon of cartwheels and a chain link miniskirt, of which I am not shitting you. It's pretty amazing. Okay, so here's good old Tim Curry describing to his poor little henchman blitz or bricks or something like that, that terrible things are gonna to happen to him if things don't go his way, right? And then the finger and the nose just get closer and closer and closer to each other, 
right, as the horrible things that are going to happen to Blitz gradually start to become more and more apparent, especially to Blitz. Look at how good that is. You should hear him too. Struggles me. I feel a presence in the forest, a force I have mercifully almost forgotten. Looking upon these frail creatures, one did not. All right, I'll let you experience that on your own. Um, old, old Ridley Scott movie, but uh, well worth. Iron Giant being electrocuted, also Vin Diesel's greatest performance. There we go. Okay, so that's a good example of transition. Now that you know that it's there, it's easy to separate, right? But up until that point, right? It doesn't become apparent until there. So that's a nice example as well. It's also a really nice example of right, how these two sets of eyes reflect each other right, inside the picture. Has everybody seen this movie? No? Yeah, I've seen it. For those of you who haven't, I'm, I'm actually jealous that you get to have this experience for the first time. This is my favorite part of this entire movie. Uh, it doesn't read. The, the audio is not good enough. Hold on. Let's see if I can find a different one. <laughs> anyway, Brad Bird did this movie. Same guy did The Incredibles. Um, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's as close to a perfect movie as you're ever going to see and is a pile of fun. Um, oh, this is a good one. Let's go back to the, uh, I promised that, you know, we'd be going back to this point, right, this thing here. And why this scene is so effective. Not sharing that, so that's good. Good educational value there. Okay, so if you're watching a Bond film, presumably you're rooting for James Bond. Right, so if you're one of those people that tracks things, right, at this point in the story, right, you can tell basically who's who. You know that this is James Bond because he doesn't have the gun. And this is, I think that character is Patrice. Right? So he's the bad guy. So if you're tracking things, as this fight scene progresses, 
you know that this is Bond and this is the Patrice character, right? Because those who have the, one has the gun, the other guy doesn't. Now, they've done a really clever job in terms of using silhouette and the limited information in the scene as a way of amplifying the, tens the tension in this scene, right? But what it's required them to do is to put it in this really limited right, aesthetic. So silhouettes, right? No details, et cetera. But you also have two characters that are about the same height. They have the same haircut. They're dressed essentially the same, right? And you can't tell anything about them other than the fact that one has a gun and one doesn't in order to distinguish them. So as this progresses, Right, look what happens right here, right, or just before that, where those two silhouettes merge into a single silhouette, right, and as a result, what ends up happening is that you don't know who's who. Did Bond get the gun? Did Bond take the gun away? Right? Did Patrice keep the gun? Right? Etc. So when they separate again, you don't know who's winning the fight. Right? And as a result, what that does is it increases the tension of this particular scenario so that you don't get what's called the reveal of who's actually lost until the camera comes up over the top, right? And then shows you that it isn't the Bond character. And so it's a very effective way of using the things that conceal information, right? Say like visual transition, hiding things in plain sight, et cetera, as a way of amplifying the tension of a particular scene. So again, you can use all of this stuff that I'm suggesting that you don't do for your assignment right, in a lot of really creative ways, right? But again, it's useful to know why you're avoiding these things before you start, you know, mussing around with them, so to speak. Um, as a really good example, of just what I mean by a silhouette, this should be painfully obvious already. That's ironic. That's what I would like your silhouettes to look like. And the more detail and attention you put into like the texture of the surrounding of the, of the silhouette, you can communicate fur, you can communicate rumpled clothing, you can communicate complex tufts of grass, bark on trees, right, et cetera. And so there's really not much limit that you have, right, in terms of the texture that you put on it, but it does, again, require a thought in terms of doing it. Um, oh, the Dracula example that I asked, right, should be obvious, as, or the Ash of the West should be obvious as well, in terms of all the, all the people clearly impaled on spikes. I, I just started including that one recently, simply because I rewatched that movie and it was fun. <clears throat> Plus, I love Gary Oldman. I mean, who doesn't? Okay, um, that's it. Those are all the words that need to come out of my face. Do you guys have any questions about what we've done, what you need to do, um, et cetera, et cetera? Because I won't see you for a week and a half now. All good? All right, well, um, if you don't have um, individual questions, then you're free to go and I will see you um, on Friday, enjoy you know a little bit more time off this week. Thanks for class. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Bye. Thank you.